morning, Pebble Harvey family. Welcome to worship today. Today, what you're going to see is a recording from our 9 a.m. service today. We're so glad that you would take part and join us and worship with us in this way. We hope that you're going to find this worship experience to be a helpful tool for you. We hope that you're using it in a way where until you're ready to come back to church full-time, face-to-face, you'll use this as a tool, but very quickly, as soon as you can, We'd love for you to join either our church or your church or some church face-to-face with a community of believers and worship together. Today's going to be a good day. We're going to open the scriptures together. We're going to sing, and we're going to honor Jesus. Why don't we pray, and we'll get started. Our Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We pray that you would help us to worship in spirit and in truth with everything that we do focused on Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's get started. Better 
grateful for the mercy of the Lord today. Say amen. Amen. He's so good and so gracious and so merciful. Today, we behold him who hung upon that cross, a great demonstration of the goodness, mercy, and love of our great God. Let's behold the Lamb together as we worship today.
This is our story. This is our story. Praising our Savior all the day long. This is our story. This is our song. Praising our Savior. chorus together one more time. This is our story. This is our song. Praising our Savior. And this is our our Savior all the day long. Lord, we're so grateful today for your goodness and your mercy, your mercy that's new every morning, your goodness that never ends, your love that knows no bounds. God, we're just really, really grateful today. God, we want to now turn our our minds and our, our hearts, all of our attention to your word, to the truths of your scripture. God, as we do that, I pray that you'd speak to us today, that you do a work in our hearts as a result of studying and worshiping through the word. God, use this time to change us, to make us more like Jesus. Do a work in this place. Fill Paul with your spirit, God. Use him for the honor and the glory of your great name. Lord, we love you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome. Good morning. Um, if you don't know who I am, like Joey said, I'm the college pastor. So if you're new here, uh, they dug really deep into the bullpen since Dusty was out. But I'm glad to be with you. If you have your Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab it. We're going to be in 1 John. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5 through about chapter 2. Uh, ending in verse 2. And while you're turning there, let me just pause and, and say a few things real quick. Uh, hey, as the college pastor, um, I don't get to do a lot of life with other people who aren't in college. And so let me just tell you on their behalf, hey, they love you guys. And listen, I love our church because you invest very heavily, very intentionally in our students. And so as they sit here in the center um, section today, on their behalf, I just want to say thank you for loving them. Thank you for supporting them and encouraging them. And I ask that maybe today you meet one of them uh, before you leave because they desperately need connection in our church. So thank you, thank you, thank you for always loving me, encouraging me to serve them well. We're about to start 1 John together over the next uh, week or so. And so I'm excited because the letter of 1 John, if you've read your Bible, is, is encouraging and it's, it's exciting. It teaches us great truths about the doctrine of Jesus and, and his goodness and his purity and his holiness. And it teaches us about what we just saying, that we can have assurance if we've placed our faith in Jesus. He is ours and we are his and there is no separation from him. The letter of 1 John is written there in a time where there's some believers who are being kind of led astray and distracted by some false teachers. And, and so John, as a kind of fatherly pastoral role for them, is writing to them. And so as you read this week, you'll see, my little children, my dear children, my little children. Dear, listen, he's writing to them not from some ivory tower, like he's got it figured out, so just do better. No, he's saying, hey, listen, I'm in it with you. You're my children. I love you affectionately and dearly. Here's what I want for you. I want life for you. I want you to know that you are Christ or you're not. 
I want your joy to be complete or I want you to see that your joy is missing. I desperately want you to know, John writes, who you are in Jesus and have confidence there. And so this morning is no different. Not only does he want us to be encouraged and assured, I think ultimately this morning, not only does he want to do that, he wants to press us a little bit. He wants to sort of wake us up. And so he gives us what I believe are some tests of authenticity of our proclamation of following Jesus. In other words, if you want to know you're a genuine follower of Jesus, I'm going to show you how you can know that. That's, t- that's today. And it's one of the most important questions in all of life, if not the most important one, is this. Do I know God, or rather, does he know me? And so he gives us some tests of authenticity, if you will. If you'll allow me, I remember when I was getting engaged, or trying to get engaged, rather, Story for another time, I can tell you in the foyer. I remember I, when I bought my first ring, you heard that right, I ended up buying two. But I remember the, my, my first time buying a ring, I was so excited, like I had some money in my pocket. I was working as a manager at a shoe store in the mall called Finish Line, if you've ever heard of it, it's like one of the only stores left open in the mall. And I remember, like, I saved up some money. I'm super excited. And one day I'm walking through the mall, and I won't say the name of this store, but I walk by this kind of, like, super shady one. It's not like a K's Jewelers or a Reed's Jeweler or anything like that. It's like one of these pop-up boutique places. This sort of, yeah, somebody said, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Been there. And I remember I walked by, and I was like, I'm just curious. And so I go, and they have this jewelry in the corner, but they also have, like, all this, like, you know, these like monogram things and like all, you know, all different types of stuff for your heart's content in the South, right? Burlaps everywhere. Too blessed to be stressed signs. And I remember seeing these rings and it was like, you know, kind of off in the corner and I was like, hmm, this is odd. And so I go and I look and, and I see this, this ring and it's, it's pretty. I don't honestly don't even know what she wants, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of focused on the price. And so I look and I go, Oh, that's pretty cheap. And they had this sign that said 50% off. And I was like, no way. And so I see the tag and I'm wondering, is it 50% off the tag or is this the 50% off price? Anybody ever been there? Right? Can I speak to the manager? Right? So here comes the lady. She comes up and she's like, can I help you? And I'm like, yes, absolutely you can help me. I see this ring. I'm intrigued by this ring. It seems pretty affordable. Peyton, right? It seems pretty affordable. He just got engaged. That's the joke. So I see this ring and it's like, it's pretty cheap. And I asked her, I was like, is it 50% off this ring? Or is it like, like this price? Or is this the 50% off price? And she's like, it's 50% off the tag. And I'm like, done. I want it right now. And then she gets super hesitant. She's like, I think I just made a mistake. So she calls the manager. and I'm like, hey, while you're kind of handling your business, we agreed to this. I'm going to go to the bank. I'm going to get this cash. I'll be right back. So I come back and she's like in tears. And I was like, oh, no. And she's like, I made a mistake. I'm like, okay, well, I love you. Can I still get the ring at the price? <laughs> and I remember buying this ring, and, and, and she made a mistake. The mistake was this. It was the sale price was the final price, but they had to honor it. And so they gave it to me. And I remember for the next couple of days thinking, man, I got a great deal. And then as I sat on it, I don't know if you're a worrier like me, but the like next couple of days were just filled with doubt. <laughs> is this real? (laughs) Like, did I get swindled? Is this ring even legit? Like, I got this place at some pop-up boutique store that sells too blessed to be stress signs. Like, this isn't a jewelry store. And so I remember, kid you not, you know what I did? I'm like, surely there's a way to know. So I go to, kid you not, every single jeweler in the Pine Belt. I'm not kidding. Ask my wife when you see her. I was so stressed out. I think that this is not legitimate. This is too good to be true. How can I know for sure? And so I go to every jeweler in the Pine Belt, and they pull out their little instrument. Anybody ever been there? Guys are like, it ain't got to be the brightest. It's just got to be real, (laughs) right? And so they go, beep, and it goes, that's real. Beep, that's real. Beep, that's real. And I'm like, 
All right, I got some confidence now. I know without a shadow of a doubt this diamond is real. If you want to know why I ended up buying another one, talk to me later over coffee. It's a doozy. But similarly to this, I think John is going to give us sort of a diamond tester. A way to know if the faith that you and I proclaim is authentic, is genuine, is the real deal. So if you're a note taker, if you are like, I got to fill in all the blanks or whatever, they're not going to be on the screen, but I want to speak them to you first so you can know where we're going and then we're going to journey together over the next 20 minutes, Lord willing. Today, the main question for all of us in the room, if I could simplify it, here it is. Am I a genuine believer? Or to word it another way, is the faith that I profess legitimate because I look at my life and it testifies to that reality? And if you're not sure today, here's, here's my hope for you. Today you can know. And not only that, for all of us in the room who genuinely know Jesus, repentance is ours today as well. I want to pray for us again, and then we're going to dive in. Before, I'm going to read you these three things. Genuine believers walk in the light. Genuine believers walk in the light. Number two, genuine believers agree with God concerning their sin. Genuine believers walk in the light, and genuine believers agree with what God says about their sin. And lastly, genuine believers know that Jesus, and he alone, is their only help in life and their only hope in death. Let me pray for you. Father, I do not deserve to be on this stage. God, you know the depths of my heart. You know my struggles. You know my insecurities. You know my failings. And left up to me, I stand no chance before you. And I'm thankful, like Joey led us in song, that it's exactly guys like me that you welcome. You welcome the weakest, it's me. You welcome the vilest, surely me. And you welcome those who are poor, not just in money, but in spirit. So I'm so thankful that you've welcomed me and called me your son. Jesus, please be gentle with us this morning as we unpack your word. God, please open our minds' attention in our heart's affection to you. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number one, genuine believers walk in the light. Look at verse 5 with me. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from who? Him. By the way, if you don't know this, in college world, we like do call and response. So it kind of helps me stay. If I ask, like I'm not asking rhetorical questions. This is the message we heard from him and proclaimed to who? So proud of you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Let's back up and look at that. He says, this is the message. Another translation says, this is. Or what I'm about to say is good news. This is the message. This is good news. And who does he say it came that we have what? Heard. If you go back and read chapter 1, 1 through 4, he's telling you something beautiful. We are proclaiming to you a message from Jesus, not just who we've heard about, who we've walked with, who we've seen, who we've touched and have experienced. You can trust the words coming out of this guy's mouth, John says. I've seen him. 
I know them. I've experienced them. I've walked with them. I saw him on a cross. I saw him in an empty tomb. I saw him resurrected. You're hearing this from an eyewitness. Trust me. Not, don't trust the false teachers who are trying to lead you astray in John's context. Listen to this message who we've heard it from and proclaim to you. Now I want us to pause real quick. Notice that John's also kind of claiming for us this morning, this wasn't his idea. Right? Whose message was it? It was Christ's message. So he's told us, and so now our job is to tell you, hey, listen, I didn't make this up. This isn't my idea. What I'm about to tell you over these next few verses is truth because who it came from. And so in the end, here's what's hard. Okay, ready? I love you. Here, here. In the end, if you disagree with what I'm about to say, John says, you don't call me a liar. You don't reject me, you call God a liar, as we'll see, and you reject him. Oh, that we would be a people who don't call God a liar and who don't reject his word. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. And now he's about to make a beautiful statement that God is what? And in him is no darkness at all. Anybody in here love English? Like anybody just like love to write papers? Anybody, anybody love to do that when you were back in school? Anybody a grammar Nazi? Right? Anybody not a grammar Nazi? Anybody not care? Yes, me too. So my wife should have like an honorary degree because every paper I wrote for seminary was terrible. And so because she is a grammar Nazi, because she loves good writing, because she is a good writer, you know what I did? Here's all my throw up on paper. Aaron, is this, does this make sense? <laughs> she got a master's degree too. The reason why I ask you is in the Greek you can't see it. This is what John says. He does a double negative. And we all know you shouldn't do that, right? This is what he actually says literally. God is light and in him is no darkness, none, not at all none. <laughs> He like repeats himself. You know what he's trying to get you to see? There is no wickedness, unrighteousness, unlawlessness. There is nothing impure about who God is. He doesn't want us to make a mistake about that. He wants you to know one thing. God is light. So Paul, what does light mean? The idea of light and darkness is all over the scriptures. It occurs 95 times in the New Testament. I don't have time to cover every single reference, but I want you to hear a few of them. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 36, 9. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. John 1, 9, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, don't miss this, shall not walk in darkness, sound familiar, but have the light of life. John 12, 36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of of light. And lastly, John 12, 46, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. All right, let's pause. We've barely made it through like one and a half verses, but this is important for us to know. Some believe light, and they're right, conveys the ideas of moral purity and goodness. God is holy. God is righteous. God is light. Yes. Some believe light conveys the ideas of truth and revelation. God is all truth. God is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He is the true light. He is the true truth. Yes. But if you go back and read John's gospel, who's writing this letter as well, his idea of light is in Jesus is 
life. Light equals life. Darkness equals death. In Jesus is true life that you seek. That's John's point. So what, pastor? John's argument is simply this. If it's true that God is light, and if it's true that Jesus is the light, then he's God in the flesh. And what he's been proclaiming to you, if you don't have him, you're in darkness. You're dead apart from your true source of life. If you deny that God is true life, then you deny Jesus. And if you deny Jesus, you deny the Father. So what, Paul? I want you to see something beautiful as, as well that I think we miss, we miss. John is not just telling you that Jesus is the only way to eternal life, which praise God because if it was left up to us, we don't have a shot. He's also telling you this. You can trust this morning. I can trust this morning. Hear me. That everything God does is good. Oh, that we would desperately cling to that reality even when it doesn't feel like it. That everything Jesus does, everything the Godhead does and is about is good and is for life and is for your joy. Not to rob you of life, but to lead you to life. Application. So if you're in the room and you don't know Jesus, and maybe it's because you're doubting the goodness of God for whatever reason, hear me. In him is no wickedness. He's not out to harm you. He's not out to abuse you. He's not out to trick you. He's not out to lie to you. He is after your good. Remember, he's writing to religious people, is he not? He's writing to a church full of genuine believers and people who are false teachers. And I think for us this morning as Christians, I think we need to do a little inventory. So bear with me. Let me love you well. Because listen, as I prepared this, I, this was for me too. So if it's true that Jesus is life, if it's true that his ways are good for us, if it's true that walking in the light is where we need to stay because God is life, then why is it that we're tempted to find life in all the wrong places? Here's a few. And I'll be honest with you, I'm going to show you my cards. This one's mine. Among the many, this is what I struggle with the most. The fear and praise of man. Paul, what does that mean? If I can impress people with how I am or how well I talk or for you, maybe how you parent or where you sent your kids to school, if you could just impress people with how you live your life and make people think you're something that you're really not, that's what's going to bring you joy. If I can just win the approval of my peers, that would be true life. The problem is men and women are sinners. The problem is men and women make terrible gods. Amen? And the great thing about God is that he isn't looking for you to impress him. That's the whole point of the gospel is that you and I were not impressive. You and I were not good. And it took Jesus taking on flesh and dwelling among us and living the life that you and I should have lived, dying a death that you and I should have died so that we can stand before the Father if we've placed our faith in the Son and have no fear of condemnation because our righteousness is not our own, but it's from Him who's perfect. That's good news this morning. You don't have to impress people. Number two... Self-righteousness or religious, religious ritual. If I just never miss Sunday school, if I never miss a box on the reading plan, if I just try really hard to be a good neighbor and to do the right things and to never mess up, then surely in the end when I stand before God, the scale will be tipped in my favor. This is life. Just be a better person. And if you were honest this morning, if that's you, you're probably pretty angry, aren't you? You see, that's what self-righteousness does in our heart. You know what it does? 
you know that you don't measure up to your own standard and so you point out the flaws in everybody else so that you can feel better about your brokenness. And John's not going to have any of that. What John is going to say is, don't you know that's not life? Hey, don't you know that God is not out after your obedience without love for him? Don't you know that it's not about impressing God with all your good deeds? It's that you weren't impressive, so he laid down his life for you. So why is it that you're trying to earn affection from God that's already yours? The last one, pleasures, possessions, and politics. Pleasures, possessions, and politics. If I just had, I would be satisfied. If I could just make just a little bit more money here, if I could just get this better job, if I could just get this person in my life, have this relationship with this person, I could advance in life. If I could just, if I had this, if I could just, if I had this, and we just sing about it, we who are in Christ, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, there's nothing else to gain. You see, the greatness of Christianity is not that you get heaven one day. The greatness of Christianity is that you have God. If I could just experience life with no laws and barriers and live the life I want to live, then surely that's where satisfaction is. That's true life. Hey, I have an 11th month old baby today. And I use this illustration in college all the time. Because isn't Christianity just a bunch of rules? Why is God's law, like, why, why do we have to obey him? So I think about my daughter. She sleeps in a crib, right? She has four walls around it. And what do they do? They're keeping her in. You may have a child fall out. Okay? We lowered the bed. Okay? But what they do is, like, this barrier is meant to keep them alive. <laughs> this barrier is meant to lead her to life. It's not out to rob her of joy. It's not out to rob her of falling over the crib and landing on her face on the carpet. No, daddy loves her, so I have put her in a position to stay alive. <laughs> you see, listen, God's law leads to life. His commands are not burdensome. They actually are good for us to follow. You realize that, right? So listen, we've barely made it anywhere I want to go. But seriously, I think we need to hear this this morning. I don't know where you're tempted to find your life, but if it's anywhere else other than the God of light, it's going to fail you. Let's keep going. Look at verse 6 and 7. So what does it mean to walk in the light? If we say we have fellowship with him while we, what, walk in darkness, we, what, and do not practice the truth. And here's the positive. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses his, cleans, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Everybody say walk. Awesome. You're paying attention. Walk carries this idea in the text of present tense continual action. And so here's John's argument. If we say we have fellowship with him, don't just think like, he's not saying like, if you say you like hang out in Sunday school with Jesus and like go eat dinner after. That's not the type of fellowship he's talking about. What he's saying is if you say you agree with the faith of the apostles... If you say you agree that Christ is the only way for salvation, if you say you agree that God is light and in him is no darkness, this will be true of you. If you say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, let me simplify it for you. John isn't arguing for sinless perfection here, okay? Everybody breathe. What John is saying is if I was late to preach today, let me give you an illustration. This isn't in my notes, so I think it's helpful. Like if I ran up here late and I was all like sweaty and like, you know, like, like, in, like disheveled, which by the way is a very big possibility. Praise God I didn't. <laughs> and I get up here and here's what I lead with. Hey, sorry I was late today. 
Man, when I was crossing the street, I got hit by an 18-wheeler. I mean, smacked me. Completely changed my life. Sorry I was 10 minutes late. And then you're looking at me, and I don't have any broken bones. <laughs> if you're looking at me, and I don't have any road rash. If you're looking at me, and I look like my shirt's tucked in, and like, like, you, what? You didn't get hit by an 18-wheeler. You woke up late and drove here as fast as you could. You were late. Hear me. Here's what John's point is here. How can we say we have fellowship with God, that we're his friend, and our life is marked by the things that he hates? You say you've met the God of the universe, John says. You say that you walk with him, that he tells me I am his own. And yet your life looks no different than somebody who has no love for Jesus. Let me just lovingly tell you. Hey, listen, if that's you this morning... If following Jesus was just, I show up to church, I prayed some sinner's prayer when I was seven, and now I'm 48, and my life looks no different than what I said when I was seven. If I just have the same cares of the world, my life is no different, my passions are no different, I have no more love for God at 48 than I did at seven years old. John is telling you, not me, John is telling you, you need to ask yourself, do you really have faith in Christ? Because if you claim to have fellowship with the God of light, your life will reflect that reality. Here's the good news, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and this is what I love, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Here's the hope for us this morning. You know confession and repentance is not just like set aside for when you first come to know Jesus. What John is trying to get you to see, listen, I want to encourage you, brother or sister in the room, in Christ, but struggling and fumbling and bumbling along the way. Hear me, that's me. What John is saying is if you have brokenness over your sin, if you recognize that you're in repair, if you're confessing your sins to Jesus, that's the marker that the Spirit of God lives in you and you are in repair and he's not done with you yet. Man, take heart this morning and listen to me. There is no shame in admitting, hey, I'm not okay. <laughs> it's just not okay to stay that way. I desperately need the blood of Jesus to cleanse me from my sin. Listen, can I tell you? The godliest people I know are the ones who are deeply aware of their remaining sin in their life. You could probably testify to that. You go up to them, hey man, like you've been really following Jesus well. Man, I really look up to you. Man, I really see that you're following Jesus. You stay close to them. If they're humble, they'll say this. Hey man, I really appreciate that. Man, if you only knew. Hey man, I've got to constantly be on my knees before the Lord, begging him to help me honor him with every fiber of my being. You know, as we run out of time, here, here's what I thought of as I was prepping this. It's so easy to be like, okay, sin is just doing bad things. So all sin is is just, you know, adultery and lying and stealing and cheating and rooting for Oak Grove. Like that, that is, that's sin. You know, the Bible also tells you, listen, none of us are off the hook here. Hey, preacher boy too, okay? I'm trying to enter into this with you. This isn't an ivory tower. This is like emergency room. You know, the Bible also says do everything you do for what? The glory of who? Hey, can I ask you, you do that every day? Hey, I don't. I don't. I wrestle with sarcasm. I'm impatient with my wife at times. I, like, listen, I, I have brokenness in me that, listen, is in repair, but the mark of a genuine believer is that they agree with God concerning that reality, and they run to the throne of grace boldly, repenting and confessing their sins day by day until he returns. Is that you? Does that mark you? Or do you act like your life is together and you have no need of Jesus? Let's move on, verse 8. Before we do that, I want you to hear this. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, said this. 
Sin may enter the heart of a Christian and fight for dominion, but it cannot sit upon the throne. The Christian no longer loves sin. He looks upon it as a deadly serpent whose very shadow is to be avoided. Is that you? Do you hate your sin? Or do you just have these pet sins that you're like, man, at least I'm better than so-and-so. I'll just keep these here. And if that's you, John's pressing you. Not me. John's pressing you. Say, hey, come to the light this morning and confess your sins so that you may be healed. Look at verse 8. We agree with God concerning our sin. we got to move. If we say we have no sin, we what? Deceive ourselves. We lie to ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a what? And his word is not in us. Look back at verse 8, if we say we have no sin. Back then, they had an issue. Some people were teaching, you can be sinless. And here's the mystery of the gospel. This is what we call justification. If you've confessed your sins to Christ, if you've called out to him for salvation, the Bible tells you in God's courtroom, you've been made right with God. You are sinless in his eyes because of the blood of Jesus. Oh, that that would sweep over us in the room, that God doesn't just love you, he likes you. He's not tolerating you. He delights in you. But functionally, we know we're still in repair, right? Like functionally, we know that's called sanctification. We're becoming more like Christ because of the Spirit's work in us. And what John is telling you, if you ever in your life, believer, he's talking to you, If you ever in your life claim to not have sin, you are what? Say it. A liar. Mm. So this should be good news to our souls this morning. You know why? Because this place is a hospital, not a country club. Because this place welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. That's you and me. Listen, there's good news in this this morning because you don't have to keep staying and struggling with finitis. You know what I mean by that? Hey, pastor. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing? Fine. Life's falling apart. Marriage is in shambles. Children are wayward. You're struggling to make ends meet. By the way, that happens here in Petal. I don't know if you know that. Hey, I... Hey, I don't know what to do about this next decision in my life. Hey, I've been struggling with this sin for my entire life, and I don't want it to be true, Paul. That's the actual honest answer. Not, I'm fine, too blessed to be stressed, too anointed to be disappointed, too prayed up to be laid up, Pastor. Listen, stop that. You know what the honest answer is for you and me? Broken but in repair. broken and in repair and I desperately need you to pray for me and to come alongside me and to point me to Jesus and hold me accountable to walking in the light because if not I'm tempted to go astray this should be a place marked by an understanding of the grace of God that cleanses us from all of our sin that's why I love Christianity let's end here we'll skip down to verses 1 and 2 as we close so number 1 Genuine believers walk in the light. They are pursuing Jesus with everything they have. And they're not just agreeing with what the world is doing. Their life is marked by progress, not perfection. Number two, genuine believers agree with God concerning their sin. They say, God, against you and you alone, I've sinned. I'm a broken human being, but apart from your grace, I have no help. Thank you that your spirit is working in me and making me more like you. And lastly, genuine believers know that Christ is our only help in life and our hope in death. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things. I love that. Hear me, kids. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Wait a minute. I thought we're always going to sin. No, what John is saying is this. Anybody in here play sports? 
or have played sports? Anybody in here like really think you, sh- you could have won state if the coach would have put you in 30 years ago? Is that you? Raise your hand, Scotty. Um, listen, if I walk up, like if I was a coach, which is hilarious to think about, but if I was a coach and I walked up to a basketball player and he was working on his jumper, she was working on his jumper, working really hard, putting hours in the gym, and I walk up to him or her and I say, hey, Sarah, hey, Jim, hey, probably wouldn't do that. I probably wouldn't practice. I probably wouldn't keep working on the jumper. You're going to miss some anyway. That doesn't make any sense. So what John is saying, hey, I'm writing to you so that you would honor God. I'm writing to you so you would stay near to God. I'm writing to you so that you would honor him. But listen, when you don't, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Everybody say advocate. With the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation. It's fancy language, isn't it? For our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Here it is. Ready? Genuine believers know that their only help is their advocate in heaven pleading their case. The language for advocate is like a lawyer, a defense attorney. When you stand in a courtroom before God guilty, Jesus is shouting, mine, I paid for his sin, I paid for her brokenness, they are mine, there is nothing to condemn, nothing to judge, you have nothing to hold against them, Father, because I gladly took the sin on myself on the cross so that I can be their helper, I can be their paraclete, the word is, I can be their ever-present help in times of trouble, not just for eternal life, but in the struggle now. Hey, believer, listen to me. The Spirit of God, the helper, dwells in you. He loves you. He cares for you. And maybe this morning you're hearing the conviction of the Spirit calling out to you saying, hey, listen, confess your sin, brother. You're living in brokenness and darkness, darkness, and I have more for you. Would you confess it and trust that my grace is sufficient for you? Don't hide in shame for me. There's no need because I took the shame. I'm your helper. I'm not your accuser. I'm your advocate. And lastly, Christ is our only hope in death. He's the propitiation for our sins. Real quick, it means this. In the Old Testament, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant would lay the tablets of the law. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant would be what was called the mercy seat. And so when they translated the Old Testament in Greek, the word they used for mercy seat was propitiation. It means satisfaction. Like to satisfy, to appease wrath. And so what they would do is they would sacrifice these animals and pour it on the mercy seat as a propitiation, as a satisfaction of the wrath due their sin for breaking God's law in the ark. But God knew that animals could not satisfy fully his wrath. We would have to constantly be sacrificing sin. And so who is Jesus? If not the sinless, spotless lamb who takes away the sin of the world, the propitiation for you and for me that you don't have to save yourself because you can never do it. You don't have to be good enough because listen, you're not impressive. I will take the wrath, do your brokenness and sin, and I will die a bloody death and sprinkle that on the mercy seat so that when you stand before me, you have no fear of condemnation. You see, every other religion in the world says do. Christianity says done. Hey, listen, believer, as we close, here's my hope for you. Here's a few things we need to take inventory of. Number one, genuine believers walk in the light. Hey, let me encourage a brother or sister in the room this morning who's in Christ and loves Jesus and is trying hard to walk in the light and to abide in him and stay near to him. Listen, you're doing the right thing. When it seems like it's hard, when it seems like it's not worth it, when it seems like, man, I keep sinning and doing the things I wish I didn't do, hear me, you sound like the Apostle Paul who says, that which I wish I did, I don't, and that which I do, I wish I didn't. Listen, that's the mark of a true believer who knows you're in repair. Stay near to Jesus. Number two, believer, hear me. A beautiful thing about following Jesus is not only do we confess our sins to Jesus, 
for cleansing, but he's also brought believers alongside us that James says, confess your sins one to another so you may be healed. That's not really popular like in the Bible Belt because we all like to act like we have our life together. But did you know God gave you a community of people to walk alongside with for you to look in the face and say, hey, I mean, I'm not doing well this week. Hey, man, I, I'm not treating my wife like I wish I would. I'm not leading my family like I wish I was. Or ladies, man, I'm finding my identity in how I parent. I'm finding my identity that I'm the better mom than the lady down the street. Hey, listen, I'm finding my identity in trying to earn God's affection I need help to believe the gospel. Listen to me. I want to encourage you. If you don't have people in your life who are walking alongside you, helping you walk in the light as he's in the light, I want to challenge you today to pray and think about who that might be for you. And it's hard and it's grimy, but it's the gospel. Lastly, genuine believers agree with God concerning their sin. Christian, are you putting sin to death like you agree with God that it's vile not just adultery not just like inappropriate images on the internet not just these varsity sins but your inability to honor God with everything that you do are you really trying to honor Christ with your life and are you running to him in confession and repentance daily if that's true of you you're in the light praise God Lastly, genuine believers have faith in Christ as their only hope in life and death. Christ didn't save you by grace and then leave it up to you to conquer your present and future sins. He saved you by grace so that in the meantime, you can approach the throne of grace boldly and receive forgiveness this morning, having no fear that God's going to treat you like somebody that doesn't belong to him. He's your propitiation. You are not the propitiation. That's good news. If you're in the room and you don't know Jesus... I want to invite you to respond, everybody really to respond this morning. As the band comes up, here's a few things I think we need to consider. Man, if you've heard the good news that Jesus is the only way for salvation this morning, I pray that you would respond in repentance and belief. I'm going to be outside. Pastors are going to be outside. People want to help you know, love, and follow Jesus. If you have questions about today's sermon, if you have questions about what it looks like to give your life to Jesus, we will be out there. Number two is this. For genuine believers in the room, listen to me. We still need to repent of our sins so that we enjoy fellowship with God and one another. Hey, maybe this morning, as you confess your sins before Jesus, maybe you also turn to your wife, you turn to your husband, you turn to your family, and you confess your sins and say, hey, listen, when I screamed at you on the way to church this morning, as we were running late, we just had to be there, right? Listen, I get it, it's tough. Hey, maybe you take some time and say, hey, I treated you improperly. I sinned against you and I sinned against God. Would you forgive me? Hey, maybe there's people in this room that you've hurt, that you've sinned against, that you've wronged. And as you confess your sins to Jesus this morning, maybe you take some time this week to get lunch or to get coffee or to grab dinner with someone that you are having a hard time with. And you confess, hey, listen, I sinned against you. I wronged you. I'm not walking in the light here. Would you forgive me? Oh, that's true religion. This morning as we opened our Bible, what we find every single time we worship together is the scriptures always invite us for a response. And maybe it is this morning that as you've been considering, uh, you'd like to place your faith in Jesus or you'd like to talk with somebody about it. I want to give you an email address this morning. My next step, phbc at gmail.com. If this morning you'd like to reach out and connect with somebody and talk to about how to place your faith in Jesus or just general questions about what you may have going on in your life and somebody to pray with you, would you email us today? I promise we'll get back with you. We want to help you along in this journey. We hope you have a wonderful week and we pray God's blessings on you. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for a day worshiping today. We pray that as we've sung, as we've opened the Bible, that, Father, you've drawn us near and that this week we'll follow you. We pray for those who need to reach out and talk with somebody about placing faith in Christ. We pray that this morning they would do that, and, Father,